I came with to share some informal remarks about responsibility and uh, although I did take this out and as I was crossing the street Nomi S Seidman said you're not going to read all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I said Nomi it's big print but <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm going <laughs> to instead I'm just going to say a little bit about this season from the standpoint of the, the um, a Jew and um, and also, I want to read some of stuff, so I've brought copies of the magazine, because inside there, uh, inside Tikkun, there's something that I'd like uh, you all to see, which is our, li our list of, um, of how, uh, some more details of how we do repentance. This is the, t um, these are the 10 days of teshuva, of, of returning, of turning, um, and sometimes called of repentance, um, in the Jewish world. And it starts with the Jewish New Year, um, on, uh, that was uh, last Wednesday night and Thursday was the first day of it and it will culminate with Yom Kippur on uh, Friday night and Saturday and I have the um, great appreciation for the GTU because um, we're holding our services here at Pacific School of Religion right across the street and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place although, wow, this is also a beautiful place. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so, yes, you're all invited if you want to come uh, to the high holiday services we're doing. The 10 days of teshuva, or of return, starts with the assumption that there's, um, that, uh, there's something to return to, and, um, and where, have we, uh, where have we gone? Um, the, it raises immediately the question of, well, what's the point of our lives on this planet? And what's the meaning of our lives? And, um, and I'm um, giving one strand of an answer uh, in Jewish tradition, not the answer, of course, because when people ask me, what is Judaism? I tell them Judaism is the 3,200-year-old argument about what Judaism is. <laughs> um, and uh, there are many, many different strands and interpretations and so forth. Um, but the, uh, the, the one such answer is that the, the meaning of our lives in the Jewish world is to be partners with God in the tikkun-ing of the world. Tikkun is the Hebrew word that means heal, uh, healing, repair, transformation. So our, uh, the meaning of Jewish life is to be partners with God and actually in Judaism we don't say it's Jewish life, we say it's human life because the very first question that uh, God asks the very first communication, really, that God has with human beings is the question of Ayeka, where are you? Where are you? Where are you in relationship to us, uh, to, to who you have been created to be, which is you're created to be in the image of God and manifestation of the God energy of the universe and God's partner in healing and transforming the world. Now, there are all kinds of theological questions that that raises that I won't do tonight, but I will do on Yom Kippur for my own congregation about what, um, what that relationship is and who is God, but I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> it's a little, little longer than informal remarks, but to say that um, the question that God asks, Ayeka, where are you, um, is, the, uh, is the, the goal of human life in part is to answer that question, to say that we are in fact going to be your partners. We are in fact going to, to act in a way that manifests the God energy in the world and brings it more into the world by our very being. And then there's a problem. And the problem is that we are often going astray. And the, the Hebrew word for hate, for sin, is chet. Uh, C-H-E-Y-T. Uh, so it's, um, and it's a word that uh, derives from or at least one interpretation of it, <laughs> let's say, derives from the archery, uh, the, from the, the sphere of archery, where chet uh, is uh, um, you're the arrow heading towards the bullseye, and then you kind of get off path here and sort of hit the guy standing next to it or whatever. But um, so um, sin is is um, doesn't have the same set of meanings that it has. Uh, 
um, acquired in at least some strands of Christianity over the course of the past 2,000 years. It doesn't have the same charge exactly that it, it had there, although over the course of our history, uh, that word has been influenced a lot by being part of a Christian world and so forth. But the, the, the concept is missing the mark, and our task is to get back on the, on the path, that is to return to what is our fundamental intent as human beings, which is to be servants of God and manifestations of the God energy of the universe. And so we need to take these 10 days every year to do what I'd call a short-term um, psycho-spiritual therapy in which we are get ourselves back in touch with what is the highest um, um, aspirations of us as human beings and how do we get back onto the path of doing that. Now, a, fir a, a central part of that is um, the notion of taking responsibility. So this is how it ties to what, uh, I, um, what this title became for, for today, of taking responsibility first for our own lives. It's very um, uh, critical in this process, this 10-day spiritual process. And by the way, when I was growing up, I had no idea that there was a 10-day spiritual pr process. I heard there were 10 days of repentance, but um, they, um, I understood that the, the holidays were about going to synagogue to going to this temple or going to the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah and then Yom Kippur and fasting on Yom Kippur and afflicting yourself. But it turns out that that's not, at least in my interpretation, that is not really what it's about at all. That, that, that services, the prayers, are cheerleading for the process. They are not the process. The process is actually working on one's own inner self and then working on one's world to get things back in alignment with where we were meant to be and who our highest being can and should be. So th that's what this process, so this 10-day process is about. And the first thing is dealing with ourselves. And what's critical in that, dealing with ourselves, is to, um, is to recognize or to take responsibility. To take responsibility is very different than um, to say, um, yeah, but. Um, you know, I did this, but I have my reasons. So let me explain to you my reasons. It's, no, it's to actually take responsibility means to say, yeah, here's where I've gone astray, or here's where I am not um, the embodiment of the fullest possibilities of who I could be. And to not blame it on the other. Okay? It, um, it's very easy to get into thinking about these holidays as about um, who else has sinned. <laughs> Who else has gone wrong? I mean, I get this, of course, all the time when we get to the next level, which is the social responsibility level. But that is the next level, and I want to go there quickly and to say, beyond the work on self, which is critical, um, and um, we have in this, in this mag actually, do you mind passing it all out to the uh, people here, because I want to re refer to something specific in there. Um, uh, and there are more under the table if they're uh, in there. If, uh, so... And let me have one, too. <laughs> um, so beyond um, taking personal responsibility, we take collective or communal responsibility. Um, that is to say that, the, um, that, it's not an, that we do not believe that a process of returning to our highest self or being in alignment with God can happen purely on an individual level there has to be a realignment of the community. And that be is based on a deep consciousness of the interaction, the fundamental interaction and interdependence of us, of us as individuals with us as the community. Now, of course, in the contemporary world where we have many different communities, then we have responsibilities that have correspondingly grown to, um, to be um, concerned about the degree to which all of the communities that we are part of and all our various identities are in fact aligned with or moving towards the task of tikkuning the world, of healing, repairing, and transforming the world, which if you want a simple definition is making it filled with, or let's say what we call our new bottom line in, um, in, in the network of spiritual progressives. The network says that the new bottom line is this, that instead of just judging an institution or a social, pra or, or a, um, a social practice or um, to be efficient, rational, and productive, 
um, to the extent that it maximizes money and power, we want a new bottom line that, ju that judges those institutions or social practices, corporations, government policies, uh, our educational system, our higher educational system, our, um, uh, our uh, justice system, our prisons, uh, and even our personal behavior to be rational or uh, productive or efficient to the extent that they maximize people's capacity to be loving and caring, kind and generous, ethically and ecologically sensitive, and enhance our capacities to respond to other human beings as embodiments of the sacred and to respond to the universe with awe, wonder, and radical amazement at the grandeur of creation. Now that, which flows from our biblical tradition, is the definition of this, inter, uh, of this interfaith organization, the Network of Spiritual Progressives. And one reason I wanted to come here was to invite you to consider joining the Network of Spiritual Progressives, because if, if what I just said makes any sense to you, that is, if it does, if you say, yeah, actually, that's a better political goal and a social goal than most that I hear being articulated these days. Um, uh, unrealistic, of course, but um, so were so have some of the greatest changes that have taken place in your own lifetime uh, been ruled as unrealistic. To build a world based on love, kindness, generosity, ethical and ecological sensitivity, and awe and wonder at the grandeur of the universe, these are goals that are what it means for us as a community to be aligned with God and to be in that process of doing that. So. Um, so the tikkuning of the world has to be on the individual as well as this uh, community responsibility level. Um, now, the, um, uh, on the other hand, uh, we can't only be responsible for the community, we also have to be responsible for ourselves. Um, and um, and uh, here we get into some issues that are um, very difficult about um, what kinds of, um, what is that um, responsibility really entail? Because it can't entail that you do nothing but work on tikkuning the world, because um, you actually have some other responsibilities to, for example, um, have um, joy and pleasure, um, to have uh, caring for the people most immediately in your life, to make a living. She said parnasa in Hebrew. It says to make, to be able to make a living so that you can afford to do, th to do that, to learn, to study, to understand, to appreciate, to pray to meditate and so forth. And yet the commitment to doing tikkun in the larger world is a major commitment and our task on this period is to, be, is to assess both on the individual and collective level where we are. And so in the Jewish tradition, when we get up and say our atonement prayers on Yom Kippur, we don't say, I sinned. We say, we sinned. We have done this and we have done that. And some people say to me, well, we haven't done that. I never did that. And, um, and our answer in the Jewish tradition is, yes, but we are mu co um, mutually responsible for each other. We are mutually responsible for each other. The, rab um, the rabbis pointed this out in a reading in the Torah that says, that says when somebody um, ha dies out in the field between two cities, the, you have to measure which person uh, which city that person is closest to. And the elders of the city then come out and offer a sin offering. And the rabbis of the Talmud said, um, uh, um, and, and in the sin offering they say, uh, we did not shed this blood. So the rabbis of the Talmud say, how could the, was, is it plausible that the elders of the city, the most respected people, would have been suspect of shedding that blood? And they say, yes, because um, uh, the responsibility of the nearest city is to take care of this person and perchance uh, that person was in need and, were, and we weren't taking care of that person. So the responsibility is not simply about what did you individually do. It's what kind of world did you allow to exist and how did you change or transform it in ways that showed real caring for other people. Get it? So that's why we say we have done this together and why, why on Yom Kippur we, um, we do uh, this um, uh, process of saying here are the sins that we have done in which we acknowledge our joint responsibility for everyone else. Um, so it was no surprise that on Rosh Hashanah, for example, we were starting to talk about 
the terrible, horrible situation in the United States at the present moment when this um, wild Islamophobia has flared up. And of course, uh, some people say, well, it's good. At least it came out of the closet. Um, and maybe you can confront it more. And there has been some element of confronting it in the public sphere that's, that is a good thing. But on the other hand, that it is there um, is terrible and uh, disgusting. And so we as Jews feel a tremendous responsibility to challenge that Islamophobia wherever we see it. And um, our congregation both, uh, we read um, parts of the Quran as a way to counter the notion that maybe the Quran was going to be burnt. And we also called for and created a public um, gatherings all around the country, the Network of Spiritual Progressives did, of, um, of setting up public gatherings all over the country on, uh, on September 11th to publicly read the Koran as a way of standing in, in solidarity. Well, of course, that's, that's um, w only one level of what our responsibility is, and, as, um, and a much stronger and much more controversial responsibility is when we say we have to take responsibility also for those who speak in our name, like those, in this, uh, those who are running the state of Israel. And in our view, in, uh, in the view of Tikkun Magazine, of Beit Tikkun Synagogue, and the Network of Spiritual Progressives, they're acting in ways that violate the highest uh, principles of the various spiritual traditions which we represent. Um, so we challenge um, the state of Israel because we feel a responsibility in connection to that that is very, very deep. Not because I don't love Israel, I do. I actually love Israel very, very much. And I care about its survival. And so I but I also believe that there is no possible way for Israel to survive unless it adopts a Jewish attitude, which is an, an attitude of loving and caring. It says in the Torah, the most frequently repeated injunction in the Torah is, when you come into your land, don't, uh, do not oppress the stranger. Remember that you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Um, so there is no way for us to have any uh, claim there unless we act in a generous and loving and caring way. Well, of course, every, as soon as I say this, everybody says, yeah, but you don't know what the other guy did. What did they do? What about the, what the Palestinians are doing? All the violence that they've thrown at us and we feel insecure, blah, blah, blah. And I say, at least for the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the task is not about what the other guy did. The task is about us, about us as individuals and us as a collective. That it's not about saying um, a response that we don't have... Um, uh, that there aren't other actors who have also gone astray at times. It's saying that's not the point. The point of getting back in alignment with our God is to, is to figure out how we can get in alignment with, uh, with our God, not how to use other people's behavior as justification for continuing to be out of alignment with our God. You get what I'm saying here? Uh, so, um, so, um, so here I just want to now just call your attention, and uh, I brought these for you to, to see and if you want to, to keep, and, um, and if, God willing, in, well, inshallah, you might even decide to subscribe. <laughs> but but um, if you go to page, um, well, what would have been page uh, 25, you'll see our, um, our High Holiday Supplement, and... Um, Pardon me? America needs repentance, yes. But what I, uh, I'm not going to, and then these next pages have several steps of what repentance would look like on a personal level. Um, but then I want to go to the page on, um, uh, three pages down that says, um, in the middle of the page, for our sins. Okay, and we have a, a list of these that um, give you a sense of, the range of things that we think are appropriate to be focused on in terms of repentance. Um, yeah, I will. I'm just going to take a few for a, for a second and then I'll stop. Um, so, um, okay. Um, the first one on, uh, under For Our Sins is for all our sins... Uh, for the sins we have committed before you in our communities by being so preoccupied with ourselves with, that we ignore the, the larger problems of the world, 
and for the sins we have committed by being so directed towards outward realities that we have ignored our spiritual development. For the sins committed in the name of the American people through our invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and the violence we use to achieve our ends. Um, for failing to prosecute those in our government who have uh, um, who enabled the torture of prisoners around the world and in an American detention centers and the denial of habeas corpus and other fundamental human rights. We go. I'll skip over to the next page. Um, for the sins of um, turning our back on the world's refugees and on the homeless in our society, allowing them to be demeaned. And another one, for the sin of not supporting ourselves, uh, each other as we strive to change. For the sin of being jealous and trying to possess and control those we love. For the sin of being judgmental. Um, for the sin of not putting our money and our time behind our ideals. And for the sin of not learning our traditions. For the sin of insisting that there is no moral equivalence between the, detail, the deaths of innocent Israeli civilians and the death of Palestinian civilians. For the sins of tribalism, chauvinism, and, th uh, and, uh, and thinking our pain is more important than anyone else's pain. Well, this is the kind of stuff that we talk about when we try to take a theology and a liturgy and make it relevant to, this, to our actual historical experience in our, our particular situation. This is what I think is the essence of taking responsibility. It means that you don't, um, you don't generalize it, you don't blame it on others, you say, hey, this is about us. And um, from the standpoint of our Jewish tradition, this is uh, fundamental to the survival of the planet. We have to be able to look uh, out, outside of our personal lives at the survival of this planet and recognize that yes, it's really in deep trouble. And that it's not just something that we can read about in the papers, it's actually our personal responsibility to be engaged in trying to save the planet from the ethos of selfishness and materialism that currently dominates. Well, this gives you some idea of where uh, taking Judaism seriously might lead you in terms of uh, responsibility and why we give so much energy to these 10 days of repentance. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, yes, get that up. Okay. Hey. Science at Rutgers University, and uh, while at Rutgers, he led a su successful um, campaign for divestment from South Africa. He's also co-founded the New Brunswick Islamic Center and uh, formerly Masjid al Khuda. Um, he served as a chaplain at Yale University and developed the chaplaincy sensitivity training for physicians at Yale New Haven uh, Hospital. He studied many years abroad, uh, Syria, briefly in Morocco, an intense study of Arabic, Islamic law, Quranic studies, and spirituality with some of the most um, profound and uh, top Muslim scholars of, uh, of our time. Um, he has published many uh, works, including Scattered Pictures, Reflections of an American Muslim, an anthology of diverse essays penned by Imam Zaid Shakir. He also, in 2008, authored uh, a treatise for the seekers of guidance, uh, translation and commentary on Imam Harith al uh, Mohassidi's uh, work on Risala. Uh, he's also co founded, of course, as I mentioned, uh, Zaytuna College, a frequent speaker. Many of you have heard him before, so without further ado, I invite uh, Imam Zayd Shakir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم in the name of God most compassionate most merciful uh, greet all of you السلام عليكم ورحمة الله عيد مبارك I'm, I'm not going to venture into Yiddish and Hebrew I just say happy holidays and uh, so we'll leave it at that but it's a great honor to be here great pleasure I, I was also uh, there Saturday and in the park and I'd like to thank all of the people who organized that gathering and those who attended it was indeed very uplifting and encouraging to see so many people from all walks of life representing so many different backgrounds and religious traditions coming together to affirm uh, our collective right to religious freedom but more importantly to, to human dignity maybe I'll just do it like this I don't think that'll help. Testing. Any case, I'll raise my voice. <laughs> well, we just celebrated as Muslims Eid al Adha, and Eid also means to return from Ada Yerudu, to return. And uh, we say at the, the time of the celebration, Kulla Amin wa Antum bil Khair. May every year come back and return and find you in a good state. So it's a prayer that the joy of uh, the day, the uh, celebration, the sense of accomplishment, having fasted 30 days or 29 based on the lunar month, in Ramadan, may that happiness return to you, may that sense of satisfaction return to you. Uh, Ramadan though is also uh, a return. So this Eid, Eid al-Fitr, follows the month of fasting. It's a day of, of eating and drinking and visit, visitation and uh, uh, celebration. And also a day to remember uh, God. Uh, it follows a month where there's a different sort of return. A month where the individual tries to return to his or her true nature. And that true nature being uh, rooted or connected to our spiritual potential, that sometimes our worldly endeavors, our worldly pursuits, our worldly entanglements uh, weakens that connection. So Ramadan through prayer, through fasting, through literally going on a soul food diet we're put back in touch with our true selves. Now that soul food diet isn't what some of you might be thinking. Uh, it's not collard greens and cornbread and... Uh, no, see, we, we Muslims, we kind of adjusted that. We put some uh, big slab of beef in place of the ham hocks. But we still endorse the soul food diet. But it's not that. It's a different soul food diet. Its staples are hunger, jua, and uh, silence, sumpt, sleeplessness, sahar, losing sleep, and isolation, uzla. Those are the four staples of the soul food diet, the food that nourishes our soul. By cutting down on our, our eating, we cut down on the few, or providing fuel for our carnal appetites. By cutting down on our speaking, we cut down on the reflexive impulse of our ego to express itself. That's the quickest and easiest way, so we suppress that. By cutting down on our sleep, we also uh, cut down on the comfort that our, the creature comfort that uh, deadens and renders insensitive sometimes our soul. And by isolating ourselves, preferably in the mosque, the last 10 days of Ramadan, but some people one day, two days, half a day, but just getting away, physically removing ourselves from that environment that provides the level of comfort that again deadens our spirit by getting away from that environment, getting in, 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 a, in an environment, a situation where we can concentrate on scripture, when we can concentrate on litanies and con concentrate on various prayers that isolation strengthens the soul. Now that strengthening the soul unleashes 
our spiritual potential. And many Muslims uh, witness this without thinking about it. For example, I'll give examples and you'll see Muslims shaking their heads and or laughing. Uh, during Ramadan we pray 20 extra units of prayer at night. These prayers are called Tarawih. And because we're fasting, because we're silencing ourselves, which is one of the uh, as one aspect of the fast uh, and doing these other things. We're on this soul food diet. It's very easy to pray those 20 units of prayer. When Ramadan passes and we start feeding ourselves again and we start sleeping our f the, uh, to the uh, measure that our soul desires, etc., then we can barely pray two rakats, two units of extra prayer. You know, with three, three or four units, we're ready to turn in and go to bed, call it quits. And Ramadan, we're able to read the Qur'an uh, one-thirtieth a day, two-thirtieths a day. And over the course of the month, we complete the whole Qur'an. And again, it's very easy. We're only limited by the available time. But we're doing it with a lot of energy and vigor. Outside of Ramadan, one or two pages, uh, and we're nodding off and <laughs> drooling on our <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you they'd laugh. <laughs> because we're, we're, we're feeding our carnal self. And so our spiritual self recedes. So Ramadan, we return to our spiritual self. And that's our true self. Because that's what makes us unique. That's what distinguishes ourselves as humans from the animals who eat like us and drink like us and sleep like us and procreate like us but they don't build altars they don't try to understand the divine they don't try to uh, develop rituals that will draw them close to uh, their creator however they might conceive that uh, we might conceive our creator and conceive the paths that lead to him so this our spiritual energy and our spiritual potential and our spiritual yearning this is what makes us uniquely human and Ramadan is a time where we get in touch with that nature and where that energy is unleashed and by unleashing that energy it makes it easy for us to internalize the messages of the Quran the teachings of the Quran and that's what it's all about we read in the Quran Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed so this is a month to encourage us to really contemplate and reflect on the message and internalize those uh, the, uh, those messages. In conclusion I'm going to share one of those Quranic messages with you. Uh, if you're in the habit of having the message of the Quran shared with you by Fox News or some other Rupert Murdoch <laughs> outlet I apologize in advance you're going to be disappointed <laughs> so there's a <laughs> there's a verse in Quran it reads ya ayyuhan nas inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arufu inna akramukum 'inda Allah atqaakum inna Allah 'alimun khabir so o oh, human kind ya ayyuhan nas We've created you from a single pair, a male and female, and made you into nations and tribes that you may, may recognize each other, the beauty and the uniqueness in each other, not that you may despise each other. Verily, the most honorable of you with God, the most noble of you with God, is the most pious amongst you. God knows all and is well informed. Uh, this verse and the reason that we uh, uh, pointed it out is that it reminds us of some things and the, the Ramadan and getting in touch with the Quran is so that we can be reminded and hence guided. First that we all share a common bond. O oh, humanity, ya yeah, nas, we've created you from a single pair of male and female and at the end of the day we're all related. Some of you might be familiar with the project uh, National Geographic is doing the, they're doing genetic marker, uh, marking, tracing the genetic markers of the family of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now as this research has progressed, they've previously traced, uh, traced the lineage of a very prominent Jewish family, the Cohen family. And they're amazed that the further back they go, 
they're finding common, common markers between the f descendants of the Prophet's family, the Sharifs, and the Kohens. And the, but there shouldn't be a surprise because we're all the children of Abraham. And so, and if we go back further, all of us, whether we're Jewish or Muslims, we're all related. We're all the children of Adam and Eve, or whatever you choose to call that prototypical couple. So we're all related. We're all brothers and sisters, and the Quran is reminding us of that. And that being the case, we're being called together. We're being called together. It reminds us that we have a common moral consciousness. And that common moral consciousness calls us to nobility. It causes, calls us to human dignity. It calls, uh, it calls us to doing those things as individuals that facilitate us coming together as groups. And finally, it, it reminds us that we have a common destiny. And that common destiny is to God that we're all returning to God, knowingly or unknowingly, we believe. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We come from God, we belong to God, and unto God we are all returning. Wa inna ilayhi rajiun. So, when we come together in peace, when we come together to cooperate, to build a better world, and this is something Muslims are enjoying to do. And it behooves us at this critical time to take that injunction seriously. Cooperate together in right and goodness and righteousness, and don't cooperate in things that involve sin and rebellion. When we come together, we are fulfilling our responsibility to, it, to each other. When we come together in peace, when we come together to do our parts respectively to work for a better world, we're fulfilling our responsibility to each other. When we live lives of dignity and lives of nobility, and when we try to cultivate the higher virtues that all religions have identified and we try to avoid the vices that all religious teachings have identified, then we fulfill the responsibility that we owe to ourselves. And indeed, we do have a responsibility to ourselves, we believe. And when we respond to the call of God, we, refill, we fulfill our responsibility to God. So I believe these are uh, teachings that all of us can relate to. And if we can find the, the wherewithal and within ourselves to respond to these calls, to come together, to be dignified, to be noble, despite the circumstances that we find ourselves surrounded by and immersed in, then, inshallah, God willing, collectively, we will make this world a safer and saner place, not only for ourselves, but for those who will come after us. So it's getting late, and uh, there's still food. Salaamu <laughs> Alaikum. <laughs>